Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There were times over this last couple years that my family were not able to keep these commands. But because of the church and people like you, you were able to keep these commands for us. Um, even looking back now, Wendy and I can see that even at our darkest moments, there was cause for rejoicing and giving thanks. So just to give you a little background about my family, there's Wendy and myself, and we have two daughters that are both in college, uh, Caitlin and Emily. And then there's Philip. He's five. Well, shortly after Caitlin, our oldest, was born, Wendy and I decided, hey, we need to raise our children in a church. And we didn't have a church. And we started church hopping. We, and we ended up at the Church of the Nazarene up on Pone Lane. And before that, I was raised Catholic. And we had been going to the church, and someone approached us. I had no idea what Sunday school was. And they said, we'd really like for you and Wendy to start coming to Sunday school. And I can remember that day, as we're pull, I, I, I still see it so bright in my head. I, I, as we're pulling out of the parking lot of the church, I look straight over across to Wendy and said, I will never attend Sunday school. Well, for those of you that don't know, I teach an adult Sunday school class every Sunday now at that church. Um, I'm sure God was chuckling quite a bit as I said those words to Wendy. And I'm sure he said to himself, this fool has no idea what I'm going to do in his life. And I really didn't. And as you will soon see here, this theme is a recurring thing in my life. God gets a lot of laughs out of my life. I, I, I truly think that. So now we, we, we fast forward to spring of 2015, and Caitlin was getting ready to be a senior, and Emily was going to be a sophomore in high school. They were both driving. And Wendy and I were talking, and we're like, man, here in another year, we're going to have all this free time. We're going, to have so, we're going to be empty nesters. And Wendy even jokingly said, she said, you know, we should have had another kid a little later in life so that we wouldn't have empty nest syndrome all at once. Again, I think you've all heard it said, if you want to see God laugh, tell him your plans. Here, Wendy and I are planning for all this free time. And I'm sure, again, God was, had a little chuckle to himself. So, in August of 2015, Wendy's nephew passed away from a drug overdose. And he was Philip's biological father. Philip's biological mother was in ICU from the same thing, headed to a, to a rehab. And Wendy's mother, who I love dearly and is sitting here, but I think as crazy as can be sometimes, she was, she's 70-some years old, and she was going to take Philip in while trying to work and take care of her husband who had Parkinson's disease. God at that moment told me that Wendy and I had to take Philip in. Wendy wasn't so sure. <laughs> And I can remember we're in Wendy's mom's driveway, and as I'm loading Philip's stuff into the back of the truck, our pastor's there, and Wendy's got tears in her eyes. I don't want to do this. And I give, I give Wendy credit, because we all know the mother does all the work, right? <laughs> but I knew we had to do it. So with some convincing, Wendy accepted it. And as we started that journey, things did not start out very well for us. Philip had many behavior issues. We battled them. We started battling the courts and his biological mom to adopt him. And it was a, it was a constant battle. Uh, I can remember New Year's Eve of that, New Year's Eve of that year and We'd been battling, and Wendy and I had very little hope in our life. It seemed like all we were doing was battling. And we weren't even sure if we were doing the right thing. It's at that time that Wendy and I both 
turned everything with Philip's life over to God. We knew God had a plan, and if it was for Philip to be with us, great. But if it was for Philip to be back with his biological mother, then so it should be, if that's God's plan. Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, I think we so often forget that God has a plan for each and every one of us sitting here. And that plan is perfect. So now... We get into October of 2016. Wendy and I will face a new set of challenges. We spent the last year battling to get full custody of Philip. Caitlin was in college, and at home it was just Wendy, myself, Philip, and Emily. Wendy had just had back surgery, and she was not allowed to do anything. So, no big deal. When Emily and I are at home, we can we can pick up the slack. Not a problem. All of a sudden, I come down, I don't even know what it was, if it was a flu or what, but I could, I could barely move. I was so sick. I had to call Dan to run me to the emergency room because Wendy couldn't drive, she couldn't move. I had to leave Emily at home to take care of Philip, and I didn't know what else to do. God, at this time, was try, he, was teaching, he was teaching me something. You know, we all like to be independent, don't we? We don't like to take help. And I was one of those, I'm a macho guy. I don't need any help. I don't need to call my friends to take care of me. Nahum 1.7 says, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in Him. See, He cares for each and every one of us if we put our trust in Him. He cared for Wendy and I. He put people and friends in place for us long before we ever knew because he knew we would need their help. We would need their prayers. We would need their care. God was preparing, especially me, to accept help. I'll be honest, I hated accepting help. I don't like accepting help. I still struggle with accepting help. But God was preparing me, saying, hey, you can't do this on your own. I will take care of you. I will provide the help you need. So now, it's New Year's Eve 2016. Philip's behavior issues are practically gone. His mom had given up rights. We were set to fully adopt him in in March of 2017. Wendy and I felt like we'd made it through a grueling 16-month battle. We had both grown spiritually. We thought things were good. And we were ready to get on with the new year. And we were like, we had so much hope going into 2017. What we didn't realize is, everything we had gone through, the battles, the sicknesses, God was just using all of that to prepare us for a much larger battle. What we... Um, we don't understand is when we're going through something, what do we do? We complain, don't we? Why am I going through this? Why do I have to put up with this? What we don't realize is God is just using what we go through to prepare us. He's making us stronger. He's making us spiritually stronger so that we rely on Him. It's sometimes painful, and we don't like it. None of us like going through battles. But what God does through our battles, He prepares us, and He's using it for His good. So, February 3rd of 2017, Philip's going in to have his tonsils removed. No big deal, right? We're joking. We're we're thinking it's going to be quick. One week later, later, on February 10th, Philip's receiving his first round of chemo. It wasn't his tonsils. He had a tumor behind his tonsils. He was diagnosed with high-risk, stage 4 neuroblastoma cancer. He had the tumor that was behind his tonsils, and then it was also in his bone marrow. We were devastated, I'll be honest. 
But we knew God would take care of us. We watched and seen Philip go through procedures and take drugs and do things that would make adults, us adults, crumble. And Philip was going in for his second or third round of chemo. And we were there over the weekends getting in chemo. And <coughs> he had a port in his chest. And it was early Monday morning. I had spent the night at the hospital with Wendy. And I was going to go right to work from the hospital that morning. And, and it was like, they always come in. I don't know why they do it. But they, they wake you up at 4 a.m. for blood draws. <laughs> So they come in at 4 a.m. to do Philip's blood draw. And I'm on the couch, and Wendy's in bed with Philip, and I, and I hear the commotion. And as I'm listening, I start hearing that they can't get blood return out of his port. And I already knew so short in this journey that what that meant. That meant them removing the needle from his chest, reinserting the needle to get the port to work again. And at this time, it, this was all very traumatic for Philip. And as I sat there on the couch laying, and Philip is screaming, I was pleading with God. I was asking God, just let his port start working. That's the only thing I was asking for. I just asked, please let blood return from his port so they don't have to change it. And if you don't know, the port, they have this huge dressing over it. And I think that's the worst part. They have to peel all this dressing off of Philip, and he had very sensitive skin. And he's screaming, and I'm, I'm just pleading with God. Just let blood come out of his port. Just let them get the blood draw. Let it start working. Well, that, God's answer that morning was no. So they had to go through the whole process of changing out the needle and redressing and putting the port back on and... So they got that done. They got the blood draw they needed. And so later that morning, I was headed back to work. I had to drive from Philadelphia back to Franklin to go to work. And as I'm driving up Interstate 79, I was angry. I was so angry at God. I was struggling. I, I, I was struggling, and I was, I was telling God, I was saying to God, you know, God, I just asked for one little thing. I just wanted you to let blood come out through his port. Why couldn't you give that to us? We've been through so much. And I was angry and I was just struggling and, and I was listening to K-Love on the radio. As I'm, as I'm, and, I, and people that were passing me on 79 probably thought I was crazy because I'm speaking out loud and there's no one else in the car and I'm speaking to God. And if you don't listen to Christian music while you're in your car, I suggest you do because God will use it to reach you. And as I'm, as I'm basically arguing with God in my car and struggling with being angry, a song comes on the radio, and it's the Mercy Me song, Even If. And this is when God really spoke to me. He said, and, and what he said to me, he says, Hey, dummy, I have it all under control. And this is when I relinquished the whole cancer thing with Philip over to God. And God used these lyrics to put it all into perspective for me. The lyrics of that song, they say, Sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now, I'm losing bad. I've stood on this stage night after night, reminding the broken it'll be all right. But now, oh now, I just can't. I know you're able and I know you can't save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is in you alone. They say it only takes a little faith to move a mountain. Well, good thing, a little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, oh, give me the strength to be able to sing, it is well with my soul. At that moment, anyone in here watch NCIS? You've heard of the Gibbs slap, right, in the back of the head? That's what God did at that moment. He gave me this slap in the back of the head and said, hey, I have this. Matthew 6, 8 says, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. 
God knew what I needed as I traveled back from the hospital that morning on Sunday. He knew I needed that song. And as we've gone through this journey, God has proven time and time again He knew what I needed before I ever asked for it. It's at this point that we really start to accept that God's plan is perfect. And at this point, I accepted the fact that my prayer would always be that God heal Philip. Because every one of us sitting here knows that all it would take is God to take his fingernail and touch Philip on top of the head and say he's healed. But I also know that if God did not heal Philip, that Philip would go to heaven. And that I would see him again someday and he'd be totally healed. Remember, God's plan's perfect. So now we get through five rounds of chemo, and it's time for Philip to go through scans. And Wendy, are, Wendy and I are, are excited. We're expecting good results. And we're sitting there in the waiting room, and, and here come Philip's two doctors, and we're like, uh-oh. This can't be good. How would the doctors be coming to seek us out already? Well, it wasn't good news. They told us the chemo hadn't done a thing. Philip actually had more cancer spots in his body than before we started the chemo. They told us the plan now is just to extend Philip's life. That he probably would not reach adulthood. The doctors decided to put Philip on a uh, chimeric antibody treatment. This treatment involved Philip being in the ICU for a week at a time every third week. The drug that he gave, that they would give Philip, would attack the nerve ending in his body. It would cause him great pain. He'd be on a morphine drip for the whole week. So we go into the first round of the treatment not knowing what to expect. By the second hour of the treatment, Philip is screaming because he's in so much pain. He says his whole body hurts. We don't know what to do. I'm bouncing, I'm holding Philip. He's hooked up to IVs and lines everywhere, and I'm bouncing him. And I said, Philip, do you want to pray? He says, Yes. As I begin to pray, within two minutes, Philip is calm. Philippians 4 6 through 7 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. I've seen God use prayer to give Philip, myself, and Wendy peace that passes all understanding. If you struggle with peace in your life, I would suggest today you examine your prayer life. You can have peace in any situation through presenting it to God through prayer. So now we've done, we get into February of 2017 and we've done 12 rounds of this antibody treatment. The cancer's gone from Philip's bone marrow and the tumor is about half its original size. But the doctors say to us, we think this treatment's reached the end. It's really not doing anything more now. It's just kind of holding the cancer at bay. And they even admitted to us, we never thought Philip would make 12 rounds of this. They said, if you'd have told us we'd go 12 rounds of this treatment, we'd have, we just said, you're crazy. But that's what God does. God's plan is perfect. And we didn't see this then, but this was all God's timing. Because Philip's doctor says, I think it's best if you take him to Philadelphia. And we, we say, okay. When, Wendy said, I'm praying for wisdom for you, for Dr. Terzak, Philip's doctor. And her wisdom was to send us to Philadelphia. 
And we walk into Philadelphia and we think there's going to be two options. They're going to do surgery or they're going to put them on this drug that we heard about and he would just take a pill. So the doctor comes in and she goes, surgery's not an option. The tumor's wrapped around his carotid artery. She said, we're not doing surgery. So Wendy and I are like, okay, you're going, to put, you're going to put them on this drug then, right? And she's like, no, we don't think that's a good option. So we're like, okay, then what are you going to do? <laughs> she says, we have a phase one clinical trial of a new drug. Philip is the eighth of nine children enrolled in this trial. And this is a miracle in and of itself. Just the, like I said, God's timing. We didn't realize it then, but it's a miracle Philip got into this trial. In and of itself, just the timing, how things worked out, that in itself is a miracle. Because there were only two spots left in this trial. And Wendy would research it, and, and there were people begging to get into this trial. We went from this chimeric treatment where we were in ICU for a week at a time and Philip was in pain. Philip takes six pills in the morning, every morning. The only side effect of the drug is he has an increase in appetite. I have a five-year-old who eats like a 16-year-old. He likes to out-eat me. Here's another plug for prayer. When we, we started this thing at Philadelphia, we had to have his scans all done again because they had to have a baseline because of the trial. So they did scans and they do, every time we do scans, they do bone marrow biopsies, which if you don't know, they put two needles deep in the back of Philip's hips right here to get bone marrow. It's while he's asleep, but when he wakes up, it's, he's very pain. He's in pain. So, I don't know who scheduled it this way down there, but they scheduled all his scans and his bone marrow biopsy, and then afterwards they wanted to do an EKG. <laughs> well, for an EKG, you've got to be still and calm. And Philip wanted to be anything but still and calm after his scans and his bone marrow biopsy. And we're, tr we're pleading with him. He's got all the leads on it, and it only takes 30 seconds for an EKG. But he will not calm down. And he says to me, Daddy, will you pray? You know, I start praying out loud, and within 10 seconds, Philip's calm. And I pray the whole time during the EKG, and they get it, and it's done. God is so powerful through prayer. We forget that we hold that power. Each and every one of us holds that power of prayer. So... Philip's been on this treatment now for a little over a year. And as we've talked about, his cancer's gone. The last set of scans we just did here early April was the first time the radiologist who reads the scans would say, this is a 100% normal scan. Remember, just a short time ago, the doctor said there was no hope. He won't make it to adulthood. We sit here today, he's cancer-free. Try to tell me that God is not in the business of doing miracles still today. Someone may say, yeah, he got a drug and that's what cured him. It wasn't God. No. God developed that drug through the doctors. And God is the only reason Philip is here cancer-free this morning. We forget, we read scripture so often, we, we read of Jesus performing the miracles that he did. He, he, brought, he healed the sick, he brought the dead back to life. He provided, and we, we read the stories of scripture and we think, man, wouldn't that be great? God's still in the business today of doing the miracles that he did back then. He's the same as he was back then, as he is today, as he will be in the future. So we continue this battle. Philip is cancer free. I think the relapse rate is 50%. We, 
We don't know how long he'll be on this drug. The doctor doesn't know. It's such a new trial. So we'll continue. We continue to trust fully in God. But here, God's plan is perfect. You've heard me say that over and over again. I cannot express to you how much my family has grown spiritually over the last couple years. We've been truly blessed this entire journey. And you're going to think I'm crazy, but cancer has been a blessing. Because there is no way without cancer I'd be standing here today speaking to you. There's no way that I could have grown spiritually the way I have grown. There's no way my wife Wendy could grow, have grown spiritually the way she's grown. Most of you don't know Wendy. Wendy is not a very talkative person. I always used to tease her she was not social. I used to be the social one. Well, it's flip-flopped. Wendy's the social butterfly in the family now. That's God. And she is that way because she, she says people need to know. People need to know what God has done in our lives and in Philip's life. Wendy hates to speak publicly. But guess what Wendy is doing next Saturday at our church mother-daughter banquet. So I ask you to keep her in prayer because I know she's nervous because she's never done this and she doesn't want to do it. But that's God. God renews us. He makes us into something different for his glory. I want to cl close today with Romans 8, 35 through 18. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine, nakedness or danger or sword? As is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, we read this scripture the only thing that can separate us from the love of God is ourselves. We are the only ones that can keep us from the love of God. We need to realize that no matter what we face, and if we're honest with ourselves, everyone here sitting in this room is battling something. Every single one of us is battling something. No matter what we're facing, if we relinquish the control and turn every situation by prayer and petition over to God, we don't even need to fight the battle. What's that scripture, what I just read, what's it say? It says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. See, he will fight the battle for us. See, it's not about us and what we're going through. See, we like to make it that way, don't we? When we're going through something, we like to make it all about us. We all, we, we like to throw the pity party for ourselves. Instead of throwing the pity party for ourselves, we need to turn it over to God and figure out how He wants to use us through that situation. See, our time here on earth is so short, isn't it? It's extremely short compared to the eternity that God guarantees us. Why would we want to waste the short time we have here making it about us. Let's make it about God and the eternity that he has for us. Because in this eternity, there's no worry. There's no battles. There's only joy and peace resting in the, pre in the presence of Jesus Christ. So I challenge you, whatever you're battling, to turn it over to God and let him use it for his glory today. Because that's what he's done with cancer in our lives. God has done some amazing things and transformed my family in ways I never thought possible. And I praise him today for that. 
And I thank him today for what he's put us through, what he's gotten us through, and how he's grown us. To him is all the glory this morning. Thank you.